Uh, good morning, thank you Chris for uh, my introduction and uh, it was very inspiring what you said. Um, so it's been a very interesting uh, beginning of the morning. Um, so I'm Maria Francesca Carli, I am a, a graduate from uh, Sloan uh, class of 1992 and I'm very pleased to be part of this conference today. As Chris said, um, a number of us got together in uh, 2014 at the breakfast in Midtown. I was part of that uh, uh, small group at that point in time. And I think that group could have now got together without uh, Kathleen Cannell. Kathleen, can you please? Uh, you. Um, Kathleen has been really inspiring us and has been uh, the emotion and the motor and the person that really pushed us forward uh, to get to today, 2017. Um, Kellen was there, Donna did help us a lot, and, and Pam today helped us uh, to really get the conference uh, um, organized, and, and obviously Chris. So, um, and I would say that uh, Dave, um, who's not here today, but has been, uh, in my view, extremely supportive uh, of what has been done in New York and, and throughout the uh, three years uh, to get to today. Um, so since then, uh, we had the vision of doing something that was global, was not, not, not just New York, and uh, that became reality. So I hope that this is just an inspiration to do the same things uh, on a regional basis uh, going forward. Um, so I have the privilege to kick off today. Um, and uh, the first session is a fire chat uh, with Martha Samuelson, uh, moderated by Antoinette Shore. Um, in which we will hear about the company culture at Analysis Group. Um, analysis Group where uh, there is empowerment of independence and commitment to values across the organization. The flat organizational structure is consensus-based and does not rely on schemes or mechanisms. As we, many of us know, Antoinette Schwar is the Michael Kern, a professor of entrepreneurship and professor of finance at the MIT School of Management and the outgoing chair of the MIT Sloan Finance Department. She holds a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago and an undergrad degree from the University of Cologne in Germany. Her research interests span from entrepreneurship and financing of small businesses in emerging markets to household finance and intermediation in retail financial markets. <coughs> she re received several awards, including the Bratton Prize for Best Paper in the Journal of Finance, and the Kaufman Prize Medal for Distinguished Research in Entrepreneurship in 2009. She's also the co-founder of Ideas42, a non-profit organization that uses insights for behavioral economics and psychology to solve social, social problems. Please join me in welcoming Antoinette to this stage. for the introduction um, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here this morning with all of you um, and it's a great pleasure to be here with Martha Samuelson who really is an exemplar of a principled innovative leader um, and somebody who's making a difference in the world. Um, Martha is the CEO and chairwoman of Analysis Group. She is, uh, since she joined Analysis Group, she has been central in the ascent of the group, in the growth of the firm and also um, as we will hear in uh, setting up an organization that really, in my mind, um, is, is the um, example of a modern firm and a firm that um, embraces a lot, in my mind, you know, the HR practices that we should all aspire to. Uh, Martha is also um, a distinguished economist who has worked on many antitrust cases, finance cases, um, so I'm delighted um, to be here this morning with Martha. Thank you, Edwin. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to start us off, um, you, you know, we heard a little bit about this one, but just to, to understand, you know, what is analysis group, what do you guys do, what's um, unique about them? That sounds so wonderful. I'm just so delighted to be here, I have to say, and to have a table of my colleagues over here is a, is a special treat. So, I, I think many of you were at this wonderful dinner that uh, Fiona and uh, some number of Sloan alone spoke at yesterday, and I thought it was terrific, and it was sort of bursts of inspiration. 
And I'm going to do sort of the opposite thing. I'm going to talk about <laughs> building a firm over a long time in many years, because that's really what I've done and what's been important to me. So what do we do in analysis group? We are always asked, are we therapists? I think maybe more over the years we've become that. But we're a group of economists, finance experts, statisticians, and what we do is quantitative work for businesses. Often it's in the context of a litigation, so we do a lot of work supporting experts in major litigations in antitrust and finance and healthcare. And then we have a big healthcare practice at our firm where we use a whole range of quantitative tools to um, uh, add value to the clients. So some of the cases we've worked on in the last couple of years, just to give you an idea of what types of things we do. I worked um, for the Department of Justice last year. They were evaluating whether to let Anthem and Cigna, the number two and the number three health insurance companies in the country, merge. Well, healthcare is 20% of the GDP. It's a very big deal to think about do you want those two firms to consolidate and what's that going to mean for prices to consumers. So that's one type of case that we work on. I also worked on something totally different, which was really fun, which was the smartphone wars. And we worked for Samsung, and in that case, Samsung, Apple uh, claimed that Samsung had infringed some of their patents, and they probably had, but they were very precise and focused, and so it was slide to unlock, implemented by going from left to right. And if you went from down to up, it wouldn't have violated the patent. So you're then trying to measure what did Apple lose, what did Samsung gain, and it's a very hard problem. And then lastly, I'll just mention the case that we love. Many of you are not from Boston, so you may frown when we bring this up. But we did the statistical work for Tom Brady. <laughs> It was a physics question. It was a question of what happens when you take footballs in from the cold to warm air. And so we had the refrigerators and analysis were filled with footballs. We just kept finding footballs on them. We'd bring them in, we'd take them out, we'd measure them. But Ted Snyder at uh, Yale testified at Tom Brady's hearing, and of course none of it mattered at all, as it turned out, because it was decided as a matter of law. But that, those are the kinds of things we work on. And I also just wanted to give those examples because they're really important to a lot of stakeholders. So those are projects where the uh, they're lawyers who care a lot about the outcome, sometimes they're regulators, there are ultimate clients, and there's the internal team. And so there are a lot of people doing a lot of work in that's fascinating and very sort of high stress and challenging uh, uh, work conditions. Right. This is actually interesting, right, from an organizational economics perspective or from a management perspective. Um, what you're describing is a very complex interaction between many different yeah. stakeholders. Can you talk a bit more about how you actually translate these very interesting activities into a business, business model, model, right? <laughs> So this is where I will say again, I think we have a very old-fashioned business model, and it's really a sort of brick-by-brick brick business model. It's a model where we try to do terrific work for the clients, uh, we try to hire great people and be really fearless about that, we try to help the people develop, we try to give credit, and, you know, for somebody like me, I think sometimes I try to get out of the way because that also turns out to be very important. I think that um, what was always important to me, maybe a, a different way of describing the business model, a shorthand, is I wanted to, and I'm going to say me, but it's many people at the organization, wanted to build an organization that was going to be sustainable, that was going to continue to exist for the long term. And there are all sorts of implications that I think come from that. If that's what you want to do, 
um, you have to have an environment that makes people successful, and you have to that you know, and you have to have an environment that people continue to thrive in and want to stay at. That's what has led to that, um, you know, focus on do the great work, collaborate, <coughs> help people develop all of those things. This is I don't know whether I told you this before, but this was actually something that. You know, I've done, I do very little economic consulting work, but the one that I did is actually with analysis group. And yeah. the thing that convinced me, because I came in with this worry that can I be intellectually honest and do that type of work? And after I had lunch with Martha and actually and Rebecca, I realized, okay, I trust you. You know, yeah. this is the person who actually thinks not like a transactional person, but yeah. somebody who wants to do the right thing. Yeah. So that really is something that transpires. You know? Yeah, I think what you're bringing up, Antoinette, is the same issue, which is, I think, about how is this going to work for the long term and not the short term. The short term, you do the transactional thing and you push somebody maybe because a client wants you to. But if you're thinking about the long term, you know, a transactional approach is just not going to work. And so mm -hmm. I think it's the right business model. Again, if that's what's important to you, and people have all sorts of different things that are important to them, we've got a community of souls where this is what's important to us, which has been terrific. And how do you protect a pension like that? I mean, yeah, yeah it doesn't come about by itself. Yeah, I think, <laughs> of course, I think about this all the time. Um, you know, what's interesting to me, maybe I'll just answer something different first, which is that as the firm was growing and you know people were joining and all of that, I don't think I ever thought I'm setting out to build a culture. And in some ways, I feel like we sort of walked the walk before we talked the talk. I think in the early years of the firm, the things that we were doing, were not things that people came to conferences like this and talked about. Now, now this is very much in vogue. People were doing very different things, I think, um, and talking about different topics when, when the firm was in its in its earlier years. But um, yeah, I think when the culture is important, you don't graduate. There's never a point where you say, "I got there, and I don't need to worry about it." You have to um, you have to fiercely protect it. I think all of the time, and you have to always be asking, "Is the right thing? Is this the right thing to do?" And you have to be able to listen to other people, and you have to be able to have your mind changed if this is not the right thing to do. And those are all those are all very important. And, and practically, what does it mean for you as a manager? Like in your, you know, management process yeah. as AG, what, you know, just to, to be more concrete, you know? So, so well, actually, when I joined the firm, I, um, I had, uh, I connected with the founders quite a lot. It was a very shaky firm when I started, and I just liked these two people who were, had founded it and were running it enormously, and I never looked back on that. But very early in my time at the firm, there, I had a disagreement with one of the founders. He wanted to, we have one P&L for the entire organization. We don't have formulas. We don't have sales credits. Or, we run the firm in a very squishy way. It's a surprising way, I think, for a group of economists. We measure everything <laughs> outside of the firm and nothing inside the firm. And I think that we think that that model grows the pie enough so that the allocation problems don't don't really exist. And we think that's why we've been so successful. But so very early on, the Bruce Stengel who founded the firm thought maybe we should split into little business units and that would be a help us be more successful. And I really didn't want to do that. I'd been at a firm that worked that way before and I thought, you know, it's just it, 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 people it's just not collaborative, it wasn't for me. And so we disagreed about it, and Bruce said, let's go off and meet with this fellow, Chris Arduous, who was a very senior organizational behavior person, was at the time at Harvard. And I thought, Bruce is just taking me to go, we're introducing a stranger, so another person will be there to tell me why I'm wrong. It just hadn't crossed my mind that there was a different goal than that. And we went in to see Chris Arduous, and he said, you know, 
I think she's right about this. And we talked and we talked and that became something we very regularly did. But it left such a mark on me, such an impression on me. Bruce founded the company. He was senior to me and he was willing to embark on a process where over and over again with all sorts of decisions where the hierarchy was moved off to the side and we tried to figure out here are two very well-intentioned people and why are they disagreeing about something and what's how can we resolve that that's left a huge mark on me and it's something we have organizational coaches that we use all the time in the in the firm we have 360 reviews all the time. We have lots of upward feedback. Um, our review process, we're just starting it now for uh, the end of this year. It's, it's so time consuming and I think it's so productive. It's so important to, to the organization. But, you know, again, so from the very beginning, I saw it, it was a model for me. There's a way to, uh, collaborate with people that isn't just who gets to make the decision, it's how to make the best decision. And it, it's left a huge mark on me. And it sounds you're translating that relation, that experience at many levels <coughs> in the audience. I, I feel like we are. And you know, again, we've, we're 850 people now. And so it's aspirational. We don't do it all correctly all of the time. We can't. But I think. You know, the door is open, and if something seems like it isn't working right, uh, we're constantly encouraging people. We have a something we say, which is the only dumb question is the one that doesn't get asked, and we feel really strongly about that, both both with the substantive work and with the, you know, why are these, why, why am I getting, why am I getting treated this way? Why am I working on something in some way that's making me uncomfortable? But if you think, right, I mean, it sounds, and you describe it, it sounds like the natural thing to do, but it's not how most companies work. Yeah. So I wonder, do you have a, you know, an opinion on why it works so well for AG? Or, you know, what is it that, um, you know, that made it possible? You know, I think businesses, uh, you're always making a choice as to what's important to you in a business. I think there are businesses where, you know, the senior people care about the money more than anything else or care about the power more than anything else or care about those kinds of things. For me, um, being in an environment, it's funny when I that probably uh, in the late 90s, the competitors from our firm started to go public. They're probably, it's a very weird business we're in. There are probably <coughs> six businesses in the country that are like analysis group that are very large and then lots of little, you know, professors and a couple of graduate students <laughs> kinds of things. And um, a number of the firms started to go public and I was convinced that that was a poor model in the long term for professional services firms because you just shouldn't have outside investors. But those firms raised a lot of money and I really had a concern about are we going to get to the long term? It's nice to think about it abstractly. And then it's just, I think what, what has been interesting has been I really do feel like we've got a little bit of a community of souls and there are people who want different things from their business activities who are doing the same thing that we're doing but they're just uh, not doing it in the way that we're doing it and so we've got a group of people who we certainly have people come and leave we have people who can't tolerate the amount of time it takes to have a consensus-based culture. We are, you know, I mentioned the review process. The review process is wildly time-consuming for all of us because we collect all this feedback, people write self-evaluations, we have meetings and meetings and meetings, and we just iterate and iterate and iterate. And it's, again, it's not about who gets to make the decision, it's about coming to a consensus decision that, um, that everybody walks away from uh, feeling happy about. But it's very time consuming. We have Sounds like a take yeah. process. It is. <laughs> it is a little bit. And then I think we have there are people who really 
view um, how a decision gets made as a referendum on their value or their, they get confused, I think, about the way to make a decision ought to be, let's figure out what's the right decision. And if it's not stick, sitting right, let's come back and let's figure out what's not right about it. Some people don't feel that way. Some people feel like who gets to make the decision is a statement of who is valuable. Uh, in an organization, and if they come to our organization, and sometimes they do, they leave because it's just not for them. Right. And it's interesting, right? It's a, it, a strategy in action, the strategy yeah. of being able also to say what you don't want, right? And you lose yeah. something, Wait, yes, yes. It, right? yes. But, but it protects something else. But it protects something that's very important, and you know, we have a we have a little bit of a marketplace test running as well because the firm has really grown and thrived over the years. So mm. uh, there, there are enough of us who, who want this and, and, and that's a good thing. Judy and I were talking about this yesterday evening at dinner and um, I said to her, I feel, I've always felt this way, but this is the way I wanted to have my business life evolve. I spend a ton of time at work. I want to feel like my colleagues have my back. I want to feel like, you know, all of that. I want to feel like I can ask their advice and trust that it's not about them. It's about what's the right advice. But I said to Judy, I feel that more right now. And I think we're not going to go the politics route, but it's impossible not to be, you know, unless you're living in a tunnel with headphones on. <laughs> it's impossible not to be aware, of whatever your politics are, that it's a very polarized and negative time in the country, in the world. I feel for me even more that the firm is a bit of an oasis and a place where people are really trying to do the right thing for others and not just like what's in it for me. And it has some extra value, at least for me, and I think for my colleagues right now, because it's just a place where people are behaving well and not just saying again what's in it for me. It's, I mean, it's interesting, I remember you talking you sometime back, it's not just not going forward into politics, but say if you think of the financial crisis, right? Yeah. You guys also had a lot of hard yeah. decisions to face then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. So, we, so yeah, sort of big decisions we've made along the way in, in, in decades, I guess. So certainly the not going public one was a big decision. And um, then in the, in the financial crisis, we made a decision that we weren't, the firm was, um, we have a, always had a lot of bank clients and for a couple of years that the work for them just fell off. I think that they were worried about whether they had enough money to make the payroll. I think they were getting sued. They'd stick the complaints in a drawer and say, we just got to figure out if we're going to get through the week or not. And so our business was slower then. And we just made a decision as a firm, as a partnership then, we weren't going to have a layoff. We weren't going to cut the compensation for people. We weren't going to rescind offers. And that the partners were going to absorb the um, uh, downturn and it just because it just felt like we were the right people to do that and but again yeah it was again that's a decision about the long term I think if you go back to thinking about what's going to make the firm sustainable over the long term uh, way past when you know I'm in the seat or whatever it's got to be that you make those kind of decisions and you um, you know you invest in the people who are going to be the future so you know you, you said you know you spent a lot of time at work. You want work to be a place that you like, right? Yeah. But at the same time, I can imagine that starting from a partnership where you're very involved, also in the day-to-day -day work, yeah. right? In the, the casework and so on, and then running an organization with 800 plus employees is is a journey, and it probably changes, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. But it changes your day-to-day -day work. Can yeah. you talk a bit about how you know that transition has been for you? Yeah. It, you know, it's funny, when I brought in the executive coach that I've been working with for the last 10 years, that really was the topic that we spent an awful lot of time on. At the beginning for me, all I needed to do was sell a ton of work and run great cases. And I could just be a role model doing that. And the partnership wasn't very big, and that, that worked fine. 
it's very different for me right now. I can't, and I'm, I miss the casework, and I'm grateful for the colleagues who make it possible for me to stay involved in the casework kind of as a, a senior consultant almost to it because, you know, the most important thing I do is run the partnership and help people become partners. That's, that's what my job is. And that has ended up being extremely time consuming for me. And, you know, speaking at conferences <laughs> like this, I do, I do a lot of this. I think it's really important and it's important for the firm. It's important for me um, mm -hmm. to do, but it's different. And I, I definitely miss, the casework is fascinating and I, I miss the amount I could be involved with it before. Do you think that, as I mean, obviously, you know, in this room, I have to think of this. But you feel that as a woman in CEO, you are asked in a way to do more of the <clears throat> development, of the mentoring, yeah. of the, you know, um, personal engagement than you know if you were not a woman. Um, now, of course, there might also be that you want to do more of it, but yeah. but the expectations might also be different. Right? So I, uh, you'll be surprised to know I've thought about this. <laughs> I know everyone in the room is going to be surprised to hear this. So I think for many of you, the issues of being a uh, senior woman professional are going to be different than they at least began for me. I think you're going to be navigating politics and successful institutions. I think you're going to be looking for mentors. I think you're going to be looking for flexibility and, and and trying to navigate all of that. So when I came to my firm, it was not a successful institution. Again, there were wonderful people who I was willing to make a bet on. But the senior people thought I was going to be good at selling work and that turned out to be, they, they didn't quite have the luxury of being sexist at that particular point in time because they were worried about work. We just didn't have enough business in the firm. And so that was kind of my early track. Uh, they helped me get to be good at, at selling work and they kind of had to keep me around because I could do something that was very important um, in the organization. So I thought a lot about this issue, the women issue, particularly over the last couple of years. Again, because my track was different, so I just didn't have kind of, I think, some of the overt sexism that some of you will, or the absence of mentors or whatever, that some of you will have run into, because it just wasn't an option at my firm. <laughs> but it's funny to me, over the last few years, watching the senior women in my organization, our organization, who I admire so much. I think it is different being a woman. I think that um, we have immense, you know, resources and empathy, emotional IQ skills, EQ skills, whatever. And I think often we do have more of them than men. I think there's also sort of a, you know, a dark side to that. I had a case recently where uh, uh, there was a very senior woman and two very senior men working on it. And the case, the client demands just blew up. We thought we were gonna be responding to <laughs> one report and we ended up responding to eight reports. The lawyers were all different. The lawyers were overwhelmed. It was just way too much. And the work conditions were not what any of us wanted them to be for some, period of time. So the senior woman came into my <coughs> office when I finally caught her. She burst into tears and she said, people are going to say I treat my teens terribly. Two senior men came into my office and said, they said, people are going to be so proud of what we've accomplished here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they turned out to be right. And that's what was interesting to me. And I spent a lot of time with this um, younger partner who I just admired tremendously. A slow graduate too, but I'm just actually <laughs> saving <laughs> off the end. Um, and I said to her, you know, whenever you start to say to yourself, people are going to say, ask yourself the question, do you believe that you're a person who abuses your team? People are going to say, is a, it just is a way and I do think more women use that language, and it's a way of being harsh on yourself. And 
that where you say, I, I, it's not necessarily what I, people are going to say it. And, you know, so I think we have uh, immense resources as women we can bring to management. And I think uh, we should be less hard on ourselves and it doesn't come easily to lots of us. It's true. It's probably also true, right, that we are so trained to endogenize yeah. the, what the world thinks, yeah. right, that it becomes second nature. Yeah. And in some cases, it's probably, to be, I mean, to be fair, it's also probably true that the world views a woman imposing a lot of work on their teams slightly differently yeah. than a man, right? It's, you see this in the classroom sometimes too. And it, I mean, it's changing over time. Yeah. And it's all of you, right, being role models in a very diverse world really yeah. helps, right? I, I mean, when I was, when I started at Stone, we were the first, I was, well, me plus two of my colleagues were the first three women hired in finance ever. Oh. Um, and, you know, I really remember we had this guy from the New York Times come and say, how can you handle me? <laughs> 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 but, the, but the, you know, the thing you didn't notice is that because we didn't have enough room, we were shipped off into a separate building. <laughs> and I thought that we were in the women's room. We the women's room to hear. We didn't notice that part. <laughs> Which obviously was not the yeah. case. But what really helped us was the fact that we were three extremely diverse women, right? Yeah. So it was a bit like you said, there was maybe not the luxury, but there was no chance to say, oh, she's behaving like a woman because you couldn't have picked three more different women between the three of us, right? Very funny. Very funny. And so that really helped yeah. because right, there was no stereotype to have. Yeah. Point, right? yeah. But it is true, I think, in class, that's, I mean, and I, like you, never feel that I experienced um, sexism among my colleagues or professionally, but in class you do see that the the empathy level that expected yeah. from you is quite different than what and that is certainly the case. Me. And yeah. that is certainly the case. And certainly for me, there are times when it's overwhelming mm -hmm. the empathy level that's expected. And I think also just because being a female CEO, I think just an awful lot of people will come to me with. It's something that's a concern or a health issue of a family member or, I mean, or whatever. And I do feel really empathetic, but there are certainly times where I feel like I can't do it. These are a lot of rocks to carry. And I, I, I do think that that's part of it as well. And I think, you know, that's something that hopefully <coughs> with more women in leadership, also yeah. people actually start understanding that this is just not something that you can so unevenly uh, yeah. impose on. Well, that's where I think that having the coaches in our organization has been a wonderful thing right. because it's not just the women who have executive coaches. And now I would have said, I would say that 90% of the partners have had very thorough 360s and more than one. I have to say, you know, they're, they're a little daunting, a 360 review. So everybody knows what that is. It's an upward review from all 360s, sort of every level of the organization. And, you know, when, the, when it comes back, if it's a skilled person who's collecting the feedback, there are things where your jaw drops and you say, oh my gosh, I had no idea that people experience me as not transparent, or people experience me as, you know, emotional, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> you know, or, or anything like that. And it's really healthy, it's healthy to do, and the men do it because the women are doing it, um, and that's just a, a healthy thing. And so I do think that they're, yeah, the emotional EQ of everybody can get raised and and certainly collecting feedback as much as you can with skilled people collecting that on how are people experiencing what I'm doing is just enormously helpful, impactful, powerful in an organization. And people care tremendously that you have asked them for that 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 feedback as well. But it has to be I mean I imagine that in a modern workforce and in a very high human capital workforce yeah. like you have, that's probably true, you know, across the board, not just for the women, for the men too, right? I mean, in a more yeah. modern work environment and and family environment too, yeah. I guess um, I would hope that those things are not just women's issues anymore. Yeah, I think that's right. And uh, as I said, we have one P and L for the entire firm, and what that means is. 
nobody has a dedicated team working for them. So, you know, there's an internal labor market and we had a difficult person at the firm a couple of years ago who people really didn't want to work with and that ended up being a problem for that person and she left and I think to some extent she left over that and so you know in a firm that's organized the way our firm is organized it's not just the that you'll get feedback and you'll hear you are being too abrasive or you need to listen better whatever but people won't be willing to work for you and the stars in particular at our organization have a lot of options in terms of who they decide they want to work with and that 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 market needs something um, so even that is a structure a, a way of running the firm that I think is conducive to encouraging good behavior from yeah. people yeah as a social scientist, um, I would love to get data on studying that in the job market, but it rings very <laughs> it rings very true to me. You know, actually coming from Germany um, to the US, this is actually what you described is the same true actually in, in my department between the professors and the graduate students. Yes, it right? has to be. So yeah, you, as yeah. a as a professor, you have to treat your grad students right yeah. because there is a market. Yeah. You go to continental Europe when you're trapped with one professor, yeah. right? The incentives change, the behavior changes, and yeah. probably, as you said before, the self-selection of who wants to be in that environment is massive, right? It's massive. And it's massive. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. It's, yeah. it's, you know, and in a way, it's a win-win or, you know, kind of a, yeah, if a, it a works good for spiral. If it, it works, if, if it works for you. We had a fellow come from a, another firm a couple of years ago, and he came to a partner's, his, his first partner's meeting, and he said, believe how much you all talk. I, mean, I, was, I said, Jonathan, there's no system that dominates in every dimension. Every, every way of organizing a firm has some benefits and some costs, and we talk an awful lot. But it was so, <laughs> yeah. so that I don't talk so much, I think in the last 10 minutes, oh. I wanted to open up Great. the conversation to, to questions from the audience. Um, I think we have some mics floating around. But do you, you want to start? I would think that it's very important to make to make to make in a public or firm. I don't. I think it's much harder. Um, I think that um, in the public firms, the pressure to over reward, it, 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 again, can you think about the long term? It's much harder in a public firm uh, to think about the long term. One of my colleagues said to me once, it's like having the worst partner you could imagine to have, you know, analysts following you. Uh, it, Culture isn't something that analysts write about. They write about profits and what happened in this quarter and, and that kind of thing. And I just think, again, making investments for the long term is what, for me and for my colleagues, is really rewarding. And I just think the pressure is all on the short term in, in a public firm. So, actually, let me say something about that, if I could, which is, I'm really talking about professional services. I'm not talking about all business models. We don't need money to develop drugs and run clinical trials, okay? We're, we're selling our time for money. That's what our business model is. And I think that there are other types of entities. Um, my husband's at a software firm. They, they're making products, those products will continue to exist when, if they sell the firm and they're not there. Ours is just, what we're selling, I think, is something that is particularly not conducive to a public model, but I don't think it's every firm shouldn't have outside capital, it's what we do. Yeah, I, I, it's very interesting, right, that you bring this up, because it's, I think, you know, from within, you know, economic theory and, and what we know, yeah. right, this is ex exactly those very high human capital yes. organizations um, where it's very tough to monetize the future income yeah. stream. And if you look at some of, say, the venture capital or private equity funds, yeah. 
that went public, right? Ultimately, what did they do? They monetized the future sure. income yeah, that's for that's that's their employees. That's what you're doing. Right? That's and what you are doing, you can say you are generous by not trying to do that, right? Like you, yeah. Mark, are taking you know, away the carried interest right. of your future partners, right? But it also means that you're not endangering the firm because, of course, if the partners in the future don't have you know, kind of a stake in the firm because somebody else went public with yeah. that already, right? It will create negative incentives. That's that's what I think. And you know, for me, when when the firms were going public, it really was scary. And we had people we were talking to. I remember a couple of professors out in California that I was working with, and they took money from a competitor and went and joined them. And we had this squishy trust-based culture, and that was the thing that we were uh, investing in. But, you know, for me, I thought if the trade-off is having people who are younger people who, in, who I've brought along and been involved with, and having them come into my office and say, you know, I think I'd be better off somewhere else, not worth it to me in a minute. You know, it's just sort of those are, and again, that's where you decide what matters to you. I respect that other people view what's important to them differently than I view it. But for me, if the trade-off is some extra dollar compared to people leaving who I care about, it's just I wouldn't think twice about it. Mm. And I think it is. Thank you. Martha, can you talk a little bit about when you're working on complex problems, you really don't know the answer before you start out, when the answer is uh, exactly what the client who's paying the bill doesn't want to hear. And how, do you know? how do we do that? That's a really good question. All right, so our, our, our cases tend to be complicated enough that um, often there's something we can do that will be helpful to the client, but sometimes we just go back with bad news. I mean, I think I view us sort of as a medical professional in the sense of it's not useful if someone comes into your office who is sick and you tell them that they're fine. Um, it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't help anybody. And so I think if there's just no way to help the client, you kind of have to tell the client, this is what we can do. And we certainly, there's situations where we say, um, you've got a big problem and you might want to think about trying to resolve this problem because there's not too much we can do for you. It, it, when we're talking, it's, you know, again, it's why Antoinette, who doesn't do this regularly, was willing to uh, uh, take on some consulting work with us. I would never ask somebody, an academic or somebody who works with us, to put, to, to say something that they didn't believe. So if the choice is tell the client there's a problem or pretend there isn't a problem, involve other stakeholders in pretending there isn't a problem, um, I wouldn't think twice about it. I thought you were gonna ask a different question too though, which sort of comes along with this, which is are there things we won't do? And again, I think in our organization, uh, it's, it's, it's actually one way to benchmark us against some of the competitors because there are some where when we say no, then the competitor shows up. And it will be types of cases, so we won't do health tobacco cases, we don't do gun cases, we don't do, um, we got asked for some horrible Swiss gold case and we can, you can imagine what that was. And, um, we wouldn't do it. There's, so there are lots of things, but there are also, as the cases evolve, there are choices, and we will often come back to the client and really negotiate between the client and the academic as to what's okay to say and what's not okay to say. And the client can put a lot of pressure on us, and it's just no one's interests are served by going beyond what, what's okay to say. Uh, I was just curious your thoughts on private capital structures and maybe lack of transparency and what, what you see as um, some of the issues there, either for your firm or others. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you're asking about how do we transfer the ownership in a private firm? Uh, and, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, the partners see the financials. Um, you know, we get we distribute financials once a month, and we have audited financials. So the the partners have access to all of that information. You know, I would say I get a call every two weeks from somebody who's wondering about how how I'm going to retire and how the firm is going to buy me out and can't they help solve this problem? And we had it's just funny, you know, like, constantly. Um, so you know, I, I, again. We don't want to have outside investors. I, so I'm just going to say for analysis group, different firms will solve these problems differently. Um, we don't value the equity uh, at all in the way that we would value it if we were a public, the public markets were, would value it because we only have a very small group of people who can be the buyers, which are you know the next group of partners coming along. And so the equity is, you know, the, the, the problem is coming up with the transfer price, which it works for the buyer and the seller when the groups of buyers and sellers are very restricted, and we seem to have done that. I sold back a lot of my stock. I had too much, and it just was important to me again. It was something that the founders did very early along in um, uh, in the life of the firm, they decided they wanted to get the equity broadly distributed. And I think that turns out to be very, very important, um, just again, for the sustainability of the firm. So all of the partners own equity in the firm. Uh, the purchase price is one that seems to work as low um, compared to any outside value. And it just seems to work for people. When we ask people, do you want more stock, they want more stock. And so that seems to be the measure of it. But it doesn't produce a dividend. It doesn't tell you anything about what you'll earn in a given year. It's just something that you'll sell back at some point to the next generation of partners. But that's how we do it. There's no magic to that. It just seems to be working for us. Wonderful. We take one more question. Good night. Um, thank you for uh, your remarks, that are very interesting. One uh, uh, yes. point you emphasize is the 360 degree review yes. process. And I have been uh, subject and given that for 25 years. <laughs> subject, right. Uh, and so I, I, I would be interested in your views, uh, coming back to the point of the women versus uh, the other population out there. Um, do you think that uh, in a service business, uh, which it is a, a human business and yeah. professional service business, uh, women are actually um, getting advanced more if the metrics are really um, technical and so they are more driven to how much you sell of a product or how much you earn in terms of customers uh, rather than the soft issues that very often uh, in a 360 reviews have uh, a very big weight. And the women are perhaps less uh, good at the selling part? The, the soft issues. The, women the, are social, less... the social part, the soft issues at upward management uh, than, uh, than men. And are much better at being benchmarked by clearly, um, clearly defined metrics. So I'm not totally sure I'm understanding the question correctly. The question is that the women suffer more when there's more discretion. In, yeah, okay. in soft dimensions, right? So I can only speak to my firm again because that's the thing I know. Um, the soft dimensions are really important in my firm, and we, you know, we look at again, we look at the upward feedback, and we this, selling work is unbelievably important. The firm goes out of business if people don't sell work. So you know, it's kind of like. The bedrock. If that doesn't happen, we can run the nicest organization and with all the upward feedback that you can imagine, and it is pointless <laughs> without having clients who are happy. Um, I think that um, the soft stuff matters, even in terms of keeping the clients happy. Personally, I think that we've got better functioning teams and we get more out of them because because the teams do feel more empowered and I think people ask more questions and the work's better. But I also think it it's all we talk endlessly during our review process about 
the soft stuff and um, it's it's just obvious to people in the broader organization, I think, that the people who are most successful in the organization are the people who are building the organization, and that, that means building the people. So I don't know that it's true everywhere. I think it isn't true everywhere, but I think for us, the, the soft skills are incredibly central to the progress that people make. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, so